Thank you very much, Liz, and, and I want to thank uh, Students for Liberty for uh, the opportunity to uh, address all of you and for putting together this uh, conference and this amazing uh, convent. So today we're going to talk about free market climate policy, and uh, this is inherently a new topic because there was no such thing as free market climate policy, uh, you know, even 10 years ago. Uh, there was no, you know, policy ideas that were being put forward, maybe very, very few, that could be called genuine free market approaches to climate. You saw a lot of um, uh, people on the right, even libertarians, who were, you know, uh, because you couldn't directly uh, uh, figure out a way to uh, remove the barriers uh, for climate solutions, they were thinking about ways to increase the barriers for things that contributed to climate. So you had think proposals from people like Jeffrey Myron at, at uh, Harvard for a carbon tax and things like that. This was the best we could seem to do as a free market movement. Now, what is free market, free market climate policy, you may ask? Uh, you know, it is basically uh, removing the barriers from uh, you know, the people who are trying to put climate solutions into place. So, for instance, uh, how many people here in the audience favor free trade? How many people favor competition? Low taxes? Property rights? Okay, that means, congratulations, you are all climate activists. You may not have realized it until now, but those are all the basic building blocks of free market climate policy. You know, let me, uh, let me explain to you a little bit about how I got here uh, to the stage, uh, you know, to talk to you about this and where the Grace Richardson Fund program uh, on pioneering uh, new free market solutions for problems like uh, climate change comes from. The, the Richardson Foundations were one of four major foundations that originated and pioneered uh, the funding for most of the new ideas that became the Reagan Revolution. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, it was Olin, Milbank, Bradley, and Skate. Uh, the basic uh, policy strategy that I learned from my father, who ran the foundation at that time, was there are two things that you should do as a philanthropist. And that is, you should try always to address the issues of the day and address them with a better free market solution. Because if you do that, no matter what the issue, you will expand freedom. And number two, the thing, this other thing that you should do is you should find the young leaders who are doing exactly that and support them. So that, that was the key strategy that led to the success and the growth of things like, you know, funding people like Robert Mundell, who, who was the, the grandfather of, of supply side economics at Columbia. Uh, you know, funding, uh, you know, free to choose, and the, the work of Milton Friedman in the, the Chicago School. Uh, these were people who were address, addressing the issues of the day and putting forward new free market solutions. So when it became time to, uh, you know, think about what I should do with this new program at the Grace Richardson uh, 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 Fund, uh, we had an old program which was phasing out, and the question was, what do we do next? I looked around and I saw that the one area where uh, the free market movement was doing a terrible job uh, of addressing the issue was climate. There were low, no climate, you know, free market climate solutions that were being put forward. The best we could do was skepticism. Uh, and skepticism may be accurate. There may be a lot of truth to the fact that, you know, climate alarmism has gone way overboard. And you can make a lot of great arguments about that. But ultimately, it's a losing strategy because it, it encourages free marketeers to push away from the table and not address the issue. And if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And that's, and that's what ha has happened, essentially. We've ceded the, the uh, policy discussion to the left on climate rather than coming up with actual solutions for the problem. So it also made a lot of sense to me that there should be uh, free market solutions because when, when we went public with this program in 2016, I pointed out to the think tanks and the, and the other philanthropists that I was talking to at the time, 
Look, you know, between 2011 and 2015, just in the last decade, you saw the poster children for clean technologies, wind and solar, go from being basically uncompetitive and unprofitable to being competitive and profitable by 2015, both of them, in the best cited locations without subsidies. They were cheaper than fossil fuels. If you cited them properly, you had, you know, um, you know, they were close to what they had to power. Uh, you could do it with a profit, and that footprint was expanded because the entrepreneurs in that area were doing a very good job of becoming more efficient. So, if that, if when you see that shift from uncompetitive and unprofitable to competitive and profitable, it means that all the policy you've been using up to that point is now out of date. Because everything that you've been doing to support something that is unprofitable, you're doing backflips to make it viable. But if something becomes profitable and competitive, suddenly the policy changes that you need to use to support it. Suddenly, competition becomes very important. If something is competitive, you need to let it go. And number two, if it has profits, you no longer need to use these highly distortive subsidies where you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You can simply use supply-side tax cuts where you're reducing the taxes on the profits. You're letting Paul keep more of his profits for solving problems. So we pointed this out in 2016, but we said, look, nobody knows how to do this. Nobody's really thought about how do you use free market policies to address a global externality problem? You know, how, how, do, you, how do you do this? How do you design this? So we, we settled on a, a process of collaborative policy innovation, charrette process. I won't go into an explanation of what that is, but it is expert, uh, expert working groups coming together to innovate and design and, and create new policy solutions. You, you basically bring in experts in from all around, and initially you don't let them out of the room until they come up with a policy solution. And in this case, we were specifying free market policy solutions, policy solutions where you are expanding freedom, you're removing barriers, you're not increasing barriers, you're not uh, limiting people's freedom. So, <clears throat> you know, what we found out is that our essentially, our initial, uh, uh, insight that competition would be extremely important uh, has been borne out. There's a, there's a great study by Wayne Weingarten at the um, Pacific Research Institute uh, where he compared the competitive versus the uncompetitive power markets in the United States. We have a little bit of both. Some are monopoly markets, some are highly competitive like Texas. It turns out that the competitive markets are decarbonizing 66% faster than the uncompetitive markets. So competition is very important. That's a significantly higher rate of decarbonization. They're also doing it with faster price reductions and greater reliability, less blackouts, uh, quicker recovery times. So competition is very important. And not only that, but the, the, the situation globally in terms of competition is much worse uh, than in the United States. In, in the developing world in particular, you have very many um, monopoly or crony-dominated power sectors which are running on the dirtiest possible fuels, like bunker fuel, coal, uh, and the dirtiest possible fuels. But because everybody's stealing everything they possibly can out of the system, uh, they're delivering, you know, maybe only two hours of electricity per day, as, as is the case in Lebanon. Uh, in that situation, not only are these extremely dirty power sectors, but, you know, you don't, you know, development is not possible if there's no power to plug in your new development to, right? Uh, women's liberation is not possible unless you can, you know, power washing machines and dishwashers, you know, you have women, uh, you know, having to spend all their time washing clothes in the rivers or uh, cooking over garbage fires in their homes, and then women and children are dying from indoor air pollution. So these, these are critical problems, and not only that, you can see as you explore this problem a little bit more that this solution to climate change, 
of increasing competition, for instance, is also exactly what you need to do to solve poverty. The solutions for climate change, if you take it seriously, and the solutions for poverty are exactly the same thing. It's more freedom, right? So we've also uh, explored um, tax policies that uh, accelerate the no normal and natural free market drivers of environmental performance. One of the studies that's also very interesting to look at is by Nick Morris, uh, who was at Heritage Foundation. It's called Free Economies or Clean Economies. Um, and it shows that the freer the economy, the cleaner the economy. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the freedom drives, uh, you know, it's not just the creation of wealth, it's also the freedom that allows for more innovation. So there are ways to accelerate the process of the normal process where capitalists will constantly improve their technology. I mean, you, this is a process that we've seen a normal driver in capitalism since the days of Cornelius Vanderbilt, who beat his competition by designing steamships that uh, were more efficient than his competitors and could carry more passengers faster using less fuel and less materials. Uh, so that kind of design innovation can actually be accelerated by the proper tax policy. For instance, in 1981, uh, the Reagan administration introduced something called accelerated depreciation among their other uh, tax reforms. Accelerated depreciation uh, is a way to expense property, plant, and equipment. Uh, you know, in, under, prior to 1981, if you have a million dollar plant uh, and it lasted 10 years, you could take an expense against your taxes of $100,000 a year. That was called straight line depreciation. Uh, the supply siders around Reagan said, hey, we will get more investment and more economic growth if we let people take that expense faster, right? So in that case, the, uh, you know, by, by making that, instead of 10 years, taking the expense in three years, for instance, uh, that encouraged people to uh, put more uh, investment into new property, plant, and equipment. They, expect, they anticipated that that would lead to growth, but what the unanticipated result was that it also led to an energy efficiency revolution in the United States. Because suddenly they found that people were putting newer equipment into the service faster, and it was always more efficient than the old equipment. All sorts of energy efficiency um, you know, uh, uh, investments penciled out. But Without going into any further detail, we have pioneered a number of tax proposals based on this, but taking it further, uh, where we are intentionally designing the supply side proposals to accelerate the kind of innovation that both leads to growth and leads to increased uh, environmental innovation. And using these in a way uh, that can not only decarbonize, uh, you know, a, a national economy, but can lead to international agreements that decarbonize the world and spread free markets globally. Thank you, Ron, for the opening statement. Now let us welcome our other esteemed panelists. Uh, Peter Klepp is the founder and head of Brussels' Office of Award-Winning British EU Affairs Policy Think Tank, Open Europe. Uh, for almost 12 years and is also editor-in-chief of Brussels Report. Daniel Hannon is an author and columnist who serves on the UK Board of Trade and is vice chairman of the Conservative Party. He has written nine books and sat as a conservative MEP for 21 years and is also founder of Vote Leave. Lorenzo Montari is the vice president of international affairs at Americans for Tax Reform and Fellows Foundation, as well as editor of the International Property Rights Index and the Trade Barrier Index. The session will be moderated by Martin Rudinger, who works as a senior research fellow at the Austrian Economic Center. Besides being an economist, he is passionate about cutting-edge technology and is a strong believer in the power of human ingenuity and individual freedom. In his current research, he focuses on inflation and environmentalism. Please join me welcoming this esteemed panel.
Hello, um, glad to be here and welcome to my co-panelists, or to my panelists, better said. Um, what Rod just said, uh, I think, can be summarized in one simple fact. The wealthier people are, the more they care about the climate. And the main failing of the government climate policy is that it actually makes people poorer. And because of that, it leads to a worse climate. So, did you, for example, know that in the last 100 years, about uh, there were about 90 to 98, depending on, on which numbers you believe, uh, less climate-related death. So I guess that's a number to think about. Uh, also, in the last 20 years, we had significant greening all around the globe. And still the governments are using climate change as a power grab. And that's why we are sitting here today discussing about free market climate change policy because that's the one that actually works. So I will open uh, the, the panel with Ben. Please talk about for as long as you like. That's a very, very dangerous thing to say. Okay, <laughs> keep it to five minutes, please. <laughs> okay, um, has anybody here seen The Simpsons movie? I sometimes think The Simpsons is a Shakespeare of our days for almost everything. <laughs> there's, a, there's a wonderful moment in that film when the dysfunctional family arrives in Alaska and a border guard says, Here's a thousand dollars! We pay everyone in Alaska this to look the other way while we destroy the environment! And it, it chimes with how a lot of people intuitively think of Alaska. Right? Republican, corporate state, zero income tax. So it came as a great surprise to me the first time I visited Alaska uh, with my children not long ago to see what an extraordinary revival of biodiversity there has been. Species that were on the brink of extinction are now uh, as numerous. You have uh, eagles there as common as magpies. You have sea otters that had almost died out at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, holding hands cutely in every bay and inlet. You have, you know, uh, bears, you have whales. The, the, the story of the comeback of whales is one of the unreported miracles of the last 20 years. Uh, there are something like five times as many polar bears now as there were in the 60s. I mean, it has been the most extraordinary recuperation made possible, as Martin just suggested, by wealth. There comes a point when you've reached a level of income where you start shooting things with cameras rather than with guns because you no longer need to worry about feeding yourself through hunting. There comes a point when you don't need to uh, chop down trees for firewood. Uh, you don't need slash and burn uh, agriculture because you've moved beyond that. Wealth is the key that unlocks all these doors. And that's why uh, I, I very much agree with what Roger said about seeding the ground, right? I mean, the, the, the clue is in the etymology. Conservatives should be natural conservationists. There is no greater example of Edmund Burke's dictum about a society being a partnership between the living, the dead, and those yet to be born than our natural environment. It was Marxism that taught that nature was a resource to be exploited. A doctrine that found brutal realization in the smokestack industries of Eastern Europe. Soviet communism turned Lake Baikal into a sewer, turned the Aral Sea into a desert, poured so much oil into the Volga River that ferry travelers had to be told not to throw cigarettes over. The best thing that has happened to the natural environment in my lifetime was the fall of the Berlin Wall. Because, and I think all of us in this room as members of the Liberty Movement understand this, we all grasp the fundamental wisdom of Aristotle that that which nobody owns, no one will look after. Property rights and wealth are the key to stewardship. My colleague, Matt Ridley, my friend Matt Ridley, has a nice phrase where he says, 50 years ago, wolves and tigers and lions were all in danger. 
What's happened today? Wolves have multiplied everywhere. Tigers have flatlined. Lions are still in danger. Why? Because wolves live in rich countries, tigers live in middle-income countries, and lions live in poor countries. The best thing that can happen to you if you are in a, uh, the category of being an endangered species is to live in a capitalist country. And by the way, if you live in a capitalist country as a human being, you are also going to enjoy a cleaner environment, right? I breathe cleaner air and drink cleaner water in London than I would in Lahore because there is a level of GDP per head that allows it. it none of this should, should surprise anyone in this room, but it is a point we have to make over and over again because the people who have captured this debate, although they often phrase their concern as being environmental, fundamentally don't like growth. Deep down, they want some kind of uh, Mesolithic society where we all exist by barter, where we don't travel, uh, and where we all depend on ultimately self-sufficient communities. And when, when, when the world gets a little bit more like that, they don't like it, by the way. They complain like, like, uh, like anything under the recession. But that is fundamentally their objection, right? They think there are too many human beings. They would like there uh, to be uh, uh, more green spaces and fewer of us. And yet, the only way in which we're going to make the rest of the world have the same advantages that the last capitalism is if we raise the standard of living. And that means free trade, investment, property rights, all of the things uh, that we know to work. So this is a huge, important crusade for our side to take ownership of. It is altogether too important to be left to the left. Thank you, Peter. Please. Thank you. Um, actually, I, I was reading the uh, proposals uh, uh, worked on by Rot um, and uh, the, the three key uh, avenues to, to promote um, free market environmentalism are opening up markets, um, scrapping subsidies, and uh, privatization. Now, it struck me that uh, I focus on the European Union and, and EU policy, that this is Originally, what the EU was supposed to do and has also done to a certain uh, degree, uh, but unfortunately, has I think um, has been doing less and less, and it has been going the opposite direction. And particularly in the European Union's uh, environmental uh, policies, this is clearly visible. I'm sure you follow the news. Only this week, um, the European Parliament voted to expand the EU's impact uh, climate tax. Emission trading system. Some people say it's not really a tax, yeah, you can have a discussion about it. It's a kind of a levy that you have to pay under certain conditions as a company. Now they basically will expand this to new sectors to, to transport, uh, aviation. Um, it's going to have a big effect. Um, flying will become uh, more expensive um, to, um, uh, to, to housing, um, heating, heating fuels. So, so um, this is all indicative of, uh, you know, a project that was actually originally meant to be uh, to be for good, and uh, indirectly also would uh, therefore um, deliver environmental benefits. Because if you have more growth to drive the economy, ultimately there's going to be more innovation, um, and um, yeah, we, we see that's no longer um, the case. Also, particularly when it comes to you know opening up uh, markets, um, people sometimes say, "Well, we have uh, we have privatized the energy market," but that's not really the case. In, in many countries, you have an incumbent. Uh, what what is uh, what, what is true that um, state-controlled companies from certain member states can operate in other countries, which in itself is good. But the real privatization in the energy market has sadly not uh, not been sufficiently. Uh, implemented, um, also particularly uh, for um, you know, certain energy sources, there has been low bureaucracy. Um, if you want to build a new nuclear plant, it's very complicated. If you want to extend nuclear plants, uh, I know in Belgium, in Belgium myself, uh, the idea is to, to extend uh, the life of, um, of, of 
or seven uh, nuclear reactors, at least five of the seven at the moment. Uh, and, and in order to do that, you, you also have to, you need to have some kind of uh, you know, public uh, consultation in, uh, in uh, I think, uh, 500 kilometer or 1,000 kilometer uh, perimeter. So, so they, make it, they make it super complicated, and this is, of course, uh, deliberate. Um, What's, what's happening at the European Union level is that also in its many policies, the EU is also um, working against nuclear power. And I would not say that this needs to be sort of uh, provided with an advantage, but it needs to be provided with an, uh, an equal footing. And, and, and even if uh, nuclear power is CO2 uh, neutral, um, Ms. von der Leyen, the president of the Commission, has, uh, has said some time ago that uh, nuclear can in no way be a cornerstone of uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions. And, and then you mentioned degrowth. Well, yeah, I think it gives it away uh, to see that the people that are so um, you know, alarmist about CO2 emissions suddenly are not so interested and often hostile to nuclear power, um, whereas um, it's, it's a fact that uh, you can only maintain the living standards and combine this with uh, drastic reduction of CO2 emission if, um, if you are at least allow nuclear uh, power. I mean, there is a ban on nuclear power, also on more innovative SMR, uh, smaller nuclear plant plants, um, both in Belgium and in, in Germany, uh, where the Greens are in charge um, at the moment. Uh, now, um, Maybe before I conclude, what one more uh, one one more issue is that the, the European Union is not only uh, trying to you know uh, promote reducing uh, CO2 emissions, but it's also trying to micromanage and dictate how CO2 emissions uh, need to be uh, reduced. It is saying that you need a minimum percentage of um, uh, what it what it calls renewable energy, which includes not only wind and solar. Uh, but also uh, hydro and uh, biomass. Now, biomass uh, simplified means uh, importing wood from Brazil and burning it in Europe, often uh, with a lot of subsidies. And, and many scientists have been protesting that this is uh, considered to be um, uh, sustainable. Um, so the, the whole thing, I think, is, is, is deeply problematic. I have uh, prepared some overview of all the ways in which uh, EU climate policies are dysfunctional, but uh, I think that would probably lead us uh, the whole afternoon. So I'll Thank you. I just want to underscore your point that um, in some environmentalist circles, nuclear energy is almost demonized because I come from Austria, and as many of you might know, uh, Austria doesn't have any nuclear reactors and we also don't want any. Uh, it doesn't even matter how much energy prices rise. We are just claiming that it's all going to work with water. Uh, let's see, I'm a little bit doubtful of that. But, uh, Lorenzo, do you want to? Well, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Of course, yes. Uh, thank you a lot for organizing this panel. Uh, I'm Lorenzo Montanari. I'm here more focused on the uh, how tools can help uh, uh, this policy. I completely agree what Daniel and people said, so I'm not repeating it. Uh, as if I'm hearing that uh, with the hat of Polos Foundation and Proctor Right Alliance, the Polos Foundation was founded in 1985 together with the Marine Shore Tax Reform under the request of Ronald Reagan. And Tolos is the place where the Athenian Senate was meeting the leader of the civil society. This is uh, the way we work every day. Uh, in the US and also around the world, building coalitions. So we focus on the producing policy paper on index on uh, free trade and uh, innovation IP property right. And we'll talk later about this. So we published the international property index with Property right Alliance and the trade barrier index. And the, the second part that, that I want to focus on is about uh, building coalitions. So I think that uh, if we want to deliver and win that uh, build a new narrative uh, about what Tanya and Rob Peter said about a, a new kind of free market approach to climate and environment, and we need to be in the coalition. So, Taurus Foundation specializes uh, since 1985 in uh, building coalition over the world, and in the US, uh, every month we gather 2,500 uh, 
think tank leaders, 55 coalition meetings happen every month in the US, 16 all over the world. Uh, Peter Clapp is running the uh, coalition meeting in Brussels very successfully, and thank you for that. Uh, maybe every month, uh, European leaders and think tank and discussion making policy. And uh, we also started in the 2013 the International Coalition Meeting in partnership with the uh, Actor Institute, the trade uh, coalition meeting in a partnership with the Institute of American Affairs. Adam Bach is here with us. We just did the last uh, with, uh, the coalition meeting, this week the coalition meeting, and uh, we started one uh, month ago with the ROD uh, partnership with the Climate and Freedom International Coalition Meeting. The last Thursday of every month. So, uh, a little bit for a minister later about this. But uh, uh, this morning, I want to more focus on this uh, what we do in terms of uh, providing tools uh, to implement policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rob, do you want to say something? Sure. The, yeah, I think it's uh, really significant at this time to have Polos uh, come as a partner to start the Climate and Freedom International Coalition meeting. I think we're at a turning point now where I think the fact that they are stepping into the space shows that uh, free market uh, uh, climate, uh, free market leaders like Grover Northwest, for instance, uh, think that it's a good idea to start a conversation on what is free market climate policy. Uh, I think that you are all invited to join the Coal Coalition meeting. Uh, come talk to me or to Lorenzo or to uh, my assistant, uh, Hallie, over there in the red jacket. Uh, you know, give us your cards and we'll add you to the, uh, the list uh, of, you know, for, for the coalition meeting. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a great uh, resource to be able to um, start talking about ways to design policy. And if you are interested in designing free market climate policy, your first opportunity to do so is tomorrow uh, at the workshop. Uh, uh, Piotr mentioned the uh, straw proposal, the Climate and Freedom Report. You can find that in your agenda uh, for tomorrow's workshop. There's a link, you can click on it to find the proposal itself, which will be the basis, the starting point for our discussions. And you can uh, come to that and you know talk about that, talk about problems with it, talk about ways to improve it, uh, make suggestions, and uh, you know we'll build go from there. Um, but uh, if there are any other speakers uh, that are speaking at LibertyCon uh, this week, we, we would invite you to join as well, uh, you know, to help uh, lead uh, the breakout group discussions with uh, uh, Dan will be uh, uh, helping and so will uh, Peter and so will Martin. Um, do you, can you make it? Yeah. He's busy. But, uh, but uh, if you would like to join us, there are lots of topics we will be covering that you may be more expert in than we are. Uh, so, uh, you know, please do come and, and sign up for that tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Um, I would suggest that we now open the floor to you um, because I guess it makes more sense to talk with you than to talk to you. So, I guess there are microphones going around. First question is here. Hello, my name is Rui. I'm from Portugal. Um, I'd like to ask, um, sometimes free markets have the challenge to incorporate externalities uh, within the markets exchange. And uh, regarding environment, this is one of the cases where it happens a lot. I would like to know how, do, how does those solutions that you are talking about address externalities that are not within the market exchanges? Well, you know, part of the, the, the problem has been the way we conceive these negative externalities and the solution to them. Uh, you know, because, uh, you know, the, the, the standard model uh, is that if you have a negative externality, uh, you know, somehow we need to price that negative externality uh, and that, you know, there's a theoretical way to do that uh, where you're, you exactly know 
what the cost of that externality is going to be to society, and you set your carbon price uh, at the level of that uh, cost, and you force the polluters to pay. The, the problem is multiple. It seems like a simple idea. You know, does anybody know where the idea for a revenue neutral carbon tax came from? Anybody? It was first proposed in 1973 by Professor David Gordon Wilson at MIT. Uh, he is um, British, uh, and he's a, a very smart, uh, you know, professor of gas turbine engineering. And you know, this, you know, he did this in response to the Arab oil crisis, proposed what was essentially a revenue neutral carbon tax. And you can see where the problem is because he's conceiving of the economy a lot like a gas turbine. It's like a machine where you can like close a valve here and perfectly get the capital flows to go someplace else. But that's not what an economy is like. First of all, we don't really know what the social cost of carbon is. There's all kinds of estimates that are all over the place. It looks very much uh, from the work of William Wardhouse that the effective carbon price uh, you know, would have to be higher than the social cost of carbon uh, to get uh, you know, an effective change. And, and the reason for this, which is due, so first of all, it doesn't make sense to do carbon pricing because the price that you have to impose is higher than the price of if you did nothing, right? But the, the, the reason for that is that the substitution effect that the carbon tax is trying to affect, the substitution from the, the uh, high emission technologies to low emission technologies is essentially blocked by competitive barriers and by technological limitations. The technologies are not a true substitute for what we have now, so people don't want to take them up. So the price of the carbon tax has to be very, very high because of these barriers. So you're also creating a framework where you're polarizing society. You're now saying that people who were heroes of the Industrial Revolution and you know, you know, fueling more prosperous lifestyle for everyone are now the bad guys, you know, they're bad, we're good, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a point of view that, you know, creates polarization in and of itself. But we can see that, you know, because these are barriers that are stopping the carbon price, the, the, the carbon price from working, right, that the better policy is to directly address those barriers, to directly open up the, the, the you know, open up your markets to competition free trade, property rights, so that uh, those new technologies and new innovations can flourish and remove your, your, your uh, reduce the taxes, you know, so that you're incentivizing innovation. So, uh, I will come back and describe specific clean tax proposals, but let me just give you one, which is, something that works in conjunction with free trade and competition and open markets as an alternative, right? Um, it, it's an alternative to carbon price. Uh, I mentioned the, the immediate expensing uh, concept, uh, you know, or, or actually, I mentioned accelerated depreciation. Immediate expensing is an improved version of that. Uh, that is a technologically neutral uh, way of, of uh, accelerating environmental performance. You can do even better, though, uh, with maybe other supply-side tax cut designs. For instance, uh, one proposal which seems to be very promising is the idea of using tax-exempt debt for property, plant, and equipment. So this is bonds, loans, even savings accounts, where there's no tax on the interest, okay? No tax on the interest means that uh, the interest rate can be lower, but the return is the same because there's no tax on it. This drives down the cost of property, plant, and equipment. It has the same effect as accelerated depreciation, except it's more cost effective. It's more cost effective because accelerated depreciation is an equity side tax cut. The return on equity in the last decade in the United States was about 13.6. The return on debt was about 4%. 
So this is a leveraged supply side tax cut using, uh, you're actually using policy leverage. So because the return on debt is lower than the return on equity, if you're building a energy project, they raise debt and equity at the same time. So if it's a 50-50 split, we're using the numbers from a decade ago about what the rates of return were, then governments are taking in 350% more revenue on the equity side than they're giving up in tax expense. That's very, very cost effective as a supply side policy to drive growth and to drive accelerated environmental innovation, right? So that's, that's an alternative to traditional carbon pricing, which, you know, the, the focus is on innovation. But not only that, if you'll come tomorrow to the, you, we will discuss how you can use uh, tools like these, what we call the Innovation Acceleration Bond Loans and Savings Accounts. The acronym is ENABLES. You can use these ENABLES as a carrot in a free trade agreement so that you could actually use these not just as an incentive for innovation, but an incentive for free trade. Because what you would be doing is saying to any country who's looking at, at this kind of a uh, free trade agreement that expands competition is, if you agree to open your markets, what you're going to get is vast international capital flows that are tax advantaged. The way it works is this. Any capitalist in a participating country, whether they're a developer of a project, an entrepreneur, a mutual fund, a bank, different kinds of investors, could raise this tax exempt debt, savings accounts, mutual funds, uh, bonds, loans, whatever instruments they want to use. They could pull the money into funds and invest them in every participating country in property, plant, and equipment, driving innovation in those countries, driving investment. So if you're a country signing up for this, you say, oh my gosh, I'm going to get a lot of investment in my infrastructure, in my plants, in my equipment. You know, it, it will drive sustainable development. So the alternative to things like a carbon tax, the term, you know, is, is you know, it's, it, we don't need to use climate policies that impose taxes where governments are spending tons of money. We can stop doing that. We can open up markets and cut people's taxes. We don't have to spend a ton of money. We don't have to raise taxes. I mean, Kato mentioned the, the, the CBAN, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. If there's anything that is an admission by the, UN, by the EU that their ETS and their climate policies don't work, it's the fact that they need a CBAN to correct the problems with the ETS, right? They've made themselves uncompetitive. They've shot themselves in the foot. Their solution to that is to shoot everybody else in the foot? Makes no sense. They tax uh, carbon, then they say, Oh, it's uh, so unfair that European companies can no longer compete, so we have to uh, put a levy on imports. And then they say, Oh, this is actually going to cost a lot to poorer people, so now we have to have a social climate fund. So, so the taxpayer and the consumer have to pay three times. Can I, can I make one, one point about the original question um, uh, about externalities? It's very interesting to look at the origin of environmental legislation or environmental protection, at least in my country. And this, this may be uh, something that holds more true of countries with common law systems than uh, in countries with civil law systems. But the, uh, the common law is very good at applying general principles to a situation that is hitherto unencountered. So in the early 18th century, we had the first case in English law of a, a flood being caused by a mine. Somebody was mining land and this caused, it, caused a flood in somebody else's land. Now, the law had never before encountered this situation because the technology that enabled them to, to drill a mine like that was, was new. So the judge said, okay, we don't have any regulations about mines, but we have a general principle that if you have a dangerous thing in your possession, there is an obligation on you to keep it leashed. And in this case, the dangerous thing is the flood. 
and therefore we will apply the same compensation as we would if it were a dog that had savaged your neighbor's sheep or something. Right? And, and this actually worked remarkably well as a principle. In the early 19th century, uh, when river pollution began, ordinary citizens would take the companies to court and say, my quality of life has been deleteriously impacted because the fish are no longer in the river or it's, it's dirty or whatever. And the, the, it was the, the, the water companies and some of the polluters who lobbied the government for regulation so that they could say, provided we have done the following, we are immune to any further private prosecution. That, that was the order. So, so don't underestimate the power of a good legal system to put real force in the hands of the private citizen. Thank you. Before giving the word to you, just a quick note. Uh, Rod uh, mentioned the concept of social cost of carbon. I want to encourage all of you to look into it. The reason is that Rob already mentioned that the numbers are all over the place. What's interesting is that sometimes, in some studies, there are even negative social costs of carbon. What does this mean? Social benefit of carbon, meaning by the same logic we want to uh, tax carbon emissions, we should, we should subsidize carbon emissions. So just some, something to think about. I said externality. I said externalities, not positive or negative. One, one point about negative externalities is that it, it's really an incorrect term for the, the phenomenon because they're really more complex externalities. In other words, some people are going to suffer, some people are going to benefit. Sometimes it's an externality, but it actually becomes an internality. You know, because what we find is that when people learn about the people that are being damaged by climate change and the, the loss of life and the loss of property, they become very concerned, the loss of species and habitats. The, the negative impacts weigh heavily in people's minds and they adjust their behavior. You see people uh, internalizing climate change. You see what's called a green premium on products. They're actually willing to pay more because of the environmental benefits that are not benefits to them, they're external benefits. So they're internalizing the externality. You need a free market for that to happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think most, if not all of us, can agree that markets, free market climate policies are a way forward. Uh, and that, for instance, uh, picking winners by the state in climate policy is not a solution, that demonizing nuclear is not a solution, that raising taxes is not a solution. However, a question I have, aren't we limiting ourselves by focusing exclusively on, on carbon policies? Because what it means is that we are excluding, in a way, other ways of innovation towards solving the climate problem. And uh, things like adaptation to warmer climate, whether this is, you know, cooling the atmosphere or um, uh, other uh, technological solutions, are basically excluded. And by by that, we are in a way giving our opponents more uh, weaponry because they they channel the whole discussion towards essentially decreasing carbon emissions, whereas solutions may lay in other areas, such as, for instance, adaptation and geoengineering. Uh, wouldn't that be a more open-minded approach, uh, a more free market approach to not exclude these avenues? Yeah, I, I think that's a very, that's a very good point. Um, I mean, on the, on the issue narrowly of, of carbon, I think in the end, we're going to need to have forms of carbon capture, which is the, the strongest argument for Rod's point about in, encouraging innovation fiscal. Uh, but you're right. I mean, why, why focus exclusively on this one area? Do you know, what, what one's always hearing in this debate about climate change deniers or climate change skeptics. I don't think I've ever met anyone who denies climate. I don't think, I've never met anyone who posits climate stasis, let me put it like that. I, I think it is a, an, but I have met many trade-off deniers. I've met an awful lot of people 
who think that you can make the necessary changes in a way that won't really cost you anything. Uh, the, the way uh, Extinction Rebellion like to phrase it is they say, the, 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 the big oil companies will have to pay. But, you know, your life isn't going to change very much. Now, that, that is not true. That is patently untrue. Uh, it's a little bit, and I'm afraid conservative politicians do this as well. Boris Johnson used to do it. They say, it's actually a great opportunity, this. We're going to create all these green jobs. So, so as well as doing the right thing by the climate, we're going to be paid for the, for the, for, for, for the fact of having done that. I mean, this is, this is very basic Bastiat and Broken Windows, isn't it? Right? I mean, it, 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 if, you, uh, uh, if there really were all these green jobs, the government wouldn't need to do anything. The private sector would have created them all already. So let's at least be honest and say, here are the costs of doing the following things. And here's which option we prefer. And I'll say one last thing. Maybe I have a certain day for myself professional as a politician. But in the years that I was in the, in the European Parliament, people were always saying to me, you shouldn't uh, opine about this. You're not a climatologist. You're not a meteorologist. You know, you're not an expert. Sure, I'm very, very happy to listen to the experts on the narrow issue of their expertise. But the question of how we deal with it is a question of trade-offs. It's a question of what is the cost and who pays it. And that is the fundamental role of an elected politician. The idea that you hand that over to somebody because they have a PhD in climatology is crazy. It's not their area of expertise. So we shouldn't allow the, the, uh, the fact of the world heating partly as a result of human activity to dictate solutions without any of the normal democratic mechanisms and procedures that we'd apply to every other question. To uh, that, just a little bit. Um, you know, free market climate policy takes that concern into consideration. Uh, you know, when we propose technologically neutral tax provisions like reducing the cost of, of capital for property, plants, and equipment, that accelerates environmental innovation of all kinds, right? So it, so it, it allows the free market to. Uh, respond as people learn about environmental externalities that they are concerned about addressing. So, um, you know, the, I, I agree with you that, you, you know, there is a danger of only looking at carbon because then you might be increasing other negative externalities from things like wind and solar, etc. But, um, and also I just wanted to mention that, you know, what Boris Johnson said is the wrong tack, but fundamentally, I do think that free market climate policy is a huge opportunity uh, for the free world and for the uh, for free market uh, advocates because this is an issue that forces us, like no other issue, to think globally because you cannot solve for the climate problem in just one country. You have to solve it everywhere. And if the solution is free trade, competition, property rights, lower taxes, you have to think about the frameworks that encourage nations to jump into freedom and competition. So I think it, I, I think it properly conceived, it's a mental discipline for the free market community to think about problems like this, problems that challenge the validity of free markets. Are we you know, ruining the planet? Or can free markets offer the solution? This is a tough problem, and it's a good mental discipline for free market advocates to think hard about this and about what, how to use free markets to provide a solution. Okay, um, I think it's time to conclude the panel, but before doing that, let me ask the last question to every one of you. How optimistic are you when it comes to freedom and to the climate? I, I, I'm very pessimistic, I'm afraid. I was a great uh, sort of Norbert Ridley rational optimist until the lockdowns. I think we're now in a moment when there is a huge appetite for state intervention. And the result of the psychological impact of a perceived collective threat is always to make people more introverted, more authoritarian, warier, 
and more demanding of the smack of firm government, whether it's a volcano, an earthquake, a war, or a plague. It almost always results in a massive increase in state power demanded by the general population, and an increase in state power which lasts long after the emergency has passed. If I think back to uh, the impact of the Second World War on my country, we then, after the victory in 1945, we had rationing until 1952, we had identity cards until 1954, we had uh, full conscription until 1960, because we, and we, and we had the economic constraints until the Thatcher reforms 40 years later. So I'm afraid, I think we are, uh, all of us in this room are going to find a much tougher job in the years ahead than we would have done up until 2020. I'm more uh, optimistic. I think um, if you look specifically at the environmental debates, um, my feeling is that sort of much of the hysteria in the media um, has definitely reduced. Uh, what is a fact is that support for nuclear power, um, for, for which I see as the key to um, you know, rational climate policies, not to promote it, but I think if you if you have the markets uh, working, this uh, this technology or anything similar will probably prevail. Uh, but the, the support for nuclear has, has increased a lot. Um, look at Germany, I think two-thirds of the population is in favor of nuclear. The Greens are slowly losing in the poll, we have to be a bit more patient. In, in France, the Greens are at 1%. Um, maybe I'm too, um, too optimistic, I don't know, but, but I think it's, if you look at Greta Thunberg, she also came in out in favor of nuclear power. It's such a no-brainer. Um, they, they are super alarmist about CO2 emissions, and at the same time, uh, deeply hostile about this particular uh, technology. So you have the eco-modernist movement, uh, which is not necessarily free market, but they, they, um, I think they take a much more reasonable, moderate view than uh, the, the Greens that tend to be represented in the green parties. So, so I think there's a lot of cause uh, for, for optimism. Well, uh, if we think that the best way uh, to protect environment is protecting through the profit of agitation, and I know Daniel has mentioned before it, and Rod as well. So I'm a little less optimistic because uh, as I was mentioning before, we have been publishing since uh, 2007 the International Profit Rate Index. And we notice, according to our data, that there is a, a constant decline in the last uh, six years of professional profit life all over the world. So it makes me less optimistic on that. Because I strongly believe that if we want to be the narrative pro environment, we need to be the narrative pro profit. The, our index was based on the study of Nando de Soto. Uh, you may know him as a free market uh, property right advocate from Peru. He wrote the famous book, book The Mystery of Capital, and he was saying basic bottom line the reason that uh, capitalism and the free market economy are not strong in South America and post Soviet countries because of lack of uh, property right. So we build the index uh, based on this study, and uh, our index is focused on. Uh, uh, three main components, the legal political environment, physical property right, and intellectual property right. And in, Rod is right, uh, there is no it is impossible to protect our environment without a strong legal uh, political system. Think about uh, judicial independence, rule of law, uh, political, uh, political stability, control corruption. The biggest disaster in the world happened during the Soviet Union and it's still happening in China in terms of the environment. So we need to protect property right, we need to use it tools that demonstrate that our narrative is strong and is winning, but we need to uh, build coalitions. So uh, there is a strong correlation between the Yale University Environmental Performance Index and our index on property right. Country that has strong protection of property right are the countries that are better protected than by So uh, there are different other uh, data that I can share with you, but uh, this is my main point. Property right is the best uh, thing to protect our freedom and our environment. Without this, uh, we cannot implement any narrative and uh, criticize what are the, the green ideology that is completely different from what we are uh, our, to our narrative. 
Uh, take the opportunity next week, we are celebrating also the International Copyright, Thing, the Copyright Day. We are uh, with New Direction, we are in Brussels uh, presenting this index and also the International Coalition Network promoting IP. Also, IP play an important role in defending uh, uh, clean technology uh, and environment. So, and I want to thank the Student for Liberty, New Direction, Peter, uh, Rod, to sign. Also, we are sent to sign this international letter that will be presented officially in Brussels. I believe property rights are the best tools, the best principle to defend our environment. Thank you. So, to build on what Lorenzo said, uh, an optimistic point on property rights. Deforestation in the rainforest, hundreds of millions of, of oh. acres uh, being cut down. Natural carbon sink being destroyed, natural habitats being destroyed. Why? Because rainforest countries generally, the governments, own far too much land that they can possibly protect. They have inadequate property rights protections. There isn't anybody standing there with a shotgun saying, don't come on my property. They, you know, it's, it's the tragedy of the commons. You compare that to the United States, where we have strong property rights, and under, under Ronald Reagan, they put in some frameworks to encourage conservation, the conservation is the tax deduction. Since that happened in the 1980s, the United States has regrown about 33 million acres of forests on private land, right? So imagine if we took that kind of a framework and expanded that around the world, what we could do to regrow rainforests. Again, property rights is a solution to climate. Um, to your question, Martin, I agree with Daniel's alarmism. I, one of the reasons I'm here is I'm very, very concerned about the state of freedom of the world. Uh, and I think that this climate issue is a way of accelerating free trade, uh, competition, property rights, etc. I think that this will help make the argument stronger. Uh, so I'm alarmed, but I'm also optimistic. I'm optimistic because of you guys. I'm optimistic because of the young freedom movement folks who don't have quite the same prejudices of some of the older fogies in this movement. And I think that you guys are going to be the ones who are leading the charge on free market climate policy uh, and pioneering uh, a new set of policies and solutions, which will be yours. And the thing that your generation brings to this argument. Just a reminder to everyone. What Ross said, that April 27th, we will have the second Climate and Field International Coalition meeting from 10 a.m. ET to 11.30. We will have the first half an hour the update from free market think tank all over the world. We will have a policy briefing with a special guest. And after will be a policy discussion led by Rob. So if you want to join, please contact us. I think it's a perfect time to start building an international coalition to support this new narrative from the market point of view. Okay, so I have to conclude the panel now. Um, hope to see many of you tomorrow and thank you for joining.